Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, today's presentation will be the first of two about the Carbon Neutral Buildings Roadmap presented here in New York. Because of the large number of attendees that we're going to have with us today, we're asking that questions be submitted throughout the presentation via the chat feature. Following the presentation, there will be a short 30-minute uh, Q&A period where we'll be able to, uh, in live uh, real time, be able to answer people's questions. And then, of course, we'll have a public comment period available as well. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted on NYSERDA's Carbon Neutral Buildings Roadmap webpage later this week. Next slide, please. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, like I said, this is the first of two webinars, which will be presenting draft contents of the Carbon Neutral Buildings Roadmap for public review and comment. Today's webinar will cover half of the roadmap, which with the other half of the roadmap presented tomorrow uh, in another webinar. The format today will be 90 minutes of presentation, followed by 30 minutes of Q&A. Tomorrow we will have a two-hour presentation, also followed by Q&A. There will be an opportunity to provide written comments following the webinars uh, as well. Today's topics are definition of carbon neutral building, metrics, technologies to enable the transition to carbon neutrality, electrification, limits to electrification, and resiliency. Topics for tomorrow's webinar will include the value proposition of carbon neutral design and construction, as well as um, uh, workforce development, policy recommendations, and the needs for public awareness and engagement, and the approach for disadvantaged communities for low and moderate income customers. Next slide, please. To kick things off for us today, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce NICE Service President and CEO, Doreen Harris. Ms. Harris has held public and private sector leadership roles, advancing clean energy projects and engineering companies for more than 20 years. During her tenure at NYSERDA, she has held executive, technical, and policy positions, including vice president of large-scale renewables. Ms. Harris is also co-chair of the Climate Action Council, and before embarking on a career in public service, Ms. Harris spent more than a decade in the energy sector, serving in management and engineering roles. Please help me welcome Doreen Harris. Good afternoon and thank you, Matt. Uh, and thank you all for joining us for today's presentation on NYSERDA's draft Carbon Neutral Buildings Roadmap, which as described will provide a framework to decarbonize New York State's buildings, both existing and future. So as mentioned um, by Matt, I am Doreen Harris, the President and CEO of NYSERDA, the state's clean energy authority. And I am very pleased to kick off this public presentation an opportunity for you to provide feedback that will guide our work to eliminate emissions from all building types, from single family to multifamily and even commercial. As you know, New York has passed the most aggressive clean energy and climate agenda in the nation, as outlined in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, notably setting a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 85% by 2050 and putting New York on a path to economy-wide carbon neutrality. With the Climate Act as our guide, we are building New York's decarbonization strategy, including the goal of achieving 70% of our electricity from renewable sources in less than 10 years. These are not arbitrary goals. They demonstrate the level of greenhouse gas emissions reductions that we need, not just in New York State, but across the country and globally to preserve and protect our planet and our communities. To put the level of work this will require into perspective, when talking about buildings, there are more than 6 million buildings in New York State, and 70% of them were constructed before the energy code, which means they were not designed to be energy efficient. In fact, in New York, buildings are responsible for one third of the economy wide greenhouse gas emissions. And New Yorkers, like you and me, pay about $31 billion annually for electricity and heating fuels. These statistics are sobering, but they represent both challenges and opportunities for New York that this roadmap will help us address. 
Carbon neutral buildings roadmap will help us guide and implement upgrades to our existing housing and buildings and ensure that new residential and commercial buildings are constructed to high performance, low emission standards. And a critically important piece of that work includes viewing it through the lens of equity. It is imperative that as we advance our carbon neutral building efforts, we ensure that the transition to a clean energy economy benefits all communities in our state, particularly those that are underserved in a traditional sense. By developing the carbon neutral buildings roadmap, we are charting a course to transition to a statewide emissions free building stock by mid century through highly replicable cost effective strategies, creating buildings that achieve superior energy performance while improving occupant health and comfort. As part of this effort, NYSERDA has worked with a team of national experts and industry stakeholders to create the draft roadmap you'll learn more about today and tomorrow. And we are now seeking broader public input and your input as well. And that is what brings us here today. The scale of what is necessary requires new ideas and collaborative partnership at all levels. The task at hand is indeed daunting, but I am hopeful and excited by the progress that is already being made here in New York and beyond. We are certainly leading the way nationally and looking beyond the United States for global solutions and partnerships that can help us drive market change and identify scalable and rec replicable solutions that address emissions, not building by building, but block by block, and community by community. We will transform the building sector through building electrification and energy efficiency, along with maximizing grid interactivity and the use of solar energy and energy storage. All of this work goes beyond goals and targets, however. Fundamentally, we need to create better living and working spaces that are safe and comfortable and we need to do this in a way that is environmentally sustainable and affordable. And to be clear, the state is already doing this work. Through a variety of programs, we are seeking to bring private capital investment into the market to construct, upgrade, and operate highly efficient buildings powered by zero emissions electricity. Our investments are supporting market initiatives and incentives for early adoption of technologies with a focus on historically underserved communities. And through our support for the development of new construction methods that use the latest materials, equipment, and digital technologies, we are also propelling the construction industry into the 21st century and fostering job growth as part of the state's growing green economy. It is important to note that the work of the Carbon Neutral Buildings Roadmap Team also served as a basis for the Climate Action Council's Energy Efficiency and Housing Panel's recent recommendations to the Climate Action Council. These recommendations will be considered as the Climate Action Council develops a draft scoping plan by the end of the year, which is expected to include a range of mitigation and enabling policies. As we continue to chart our path forward, your input on this roadmap is critically important to helping us progress toward our shared climate goals. And I personally would like to sincerely thank the NYSERDA team of Greg Hale, Matt Brown, Patrick O'Shea, Caitlin Moody, Nicole Haramadi, Michelle Fiano, Zach Zill, John Lee, and Vanessa Ulmer, who have led this effort at NYSERDA along with our consulting teams at the New Buildings Institute, Arup, and Rocky Mountain Institute. And most importantly, thank you for being part of today's discussions and for providing your active and important feedback. Thank you again, and back to you, Matt. Thanks so much, Doreen. That was a great framing and introduction uh, to inform and, and kick off today's discussion. Um, before we do get into the substantive uh, material that we're going to share with the uh, public today, I do want to take just a brief moment and introduce the rest of our speakers. Next slide, please. Our first speaker will be Greg Hale. Mr. Hale is a senior policy advisor at NYSERDA, leading energy efficiency markets, finance, and carbon neutral building development for New York State. Greg will take us through the introduction 
metrics and building stock characteristics, as well as um, a number of other framing topics uh, associated with the roadmap. Uh, Greg will be followed by Michal Haramadi and Kara Carmichael, who will describe the technologies to enable building electrification, decarbonization. Next slide, please. Michal Haramadi is a carbon neutral buildings fellow at NYSERDA. Michal joined us a couple of years ago, and along with Kara Carmichael from RMI, will describe the technologies that will achieve carbon neutrality in buildings. Kara Carmichael is a senior principal for carbon free buildings at Rocky Mountain Institute. Kara leads the Institute's grid interactive buildings and zero carbon road mapping work. Kara brings architecture and engineering and has over 20 years of experience in the market. Next slide, please. Dan Off is a director at E3. Dan has extensive experience doing grid modeling and economy-wide um, modeling. Next slide, please. Dan will speak to us about electrification and the challenges of electrification. And Amanda Stevens, who's a senior project manager at NYSERDA and is one of our leads for uh, resiliency and has provided input throughout the carbon neutral buildings roadmap process, as well as uh, program input for many years at NYSERDA. I'd like now to go ahead and pass the uh, presentation over to Greg, who will go ahead and get started on the, on the roadmap presentation. Thank you, Matt. Um, this is weird. We're ahead of schedule. Should I just wait for a while? Just kidding. I'm never finishing time anyway, so gives me a better shot at it. But thanks, Matt, for that introduction. And thank you, uh, Doreen, for kicking off our presentation today. It's really an exciting milestone for our roadmap team. Uh, and we're really pleased to be here today and tomorrow to present our draft carbon neutral buildings roadmap for public input. And thanks to everybody out there, reiterating Doreen's comment, everybody out in this audience uh, for taking the time to tune in. Um, it's really important that you give us your feedback and we look forward to receiving it. So in Governor Cuomo's 2019 State of the State address, the governor had the foresight to direct New York State or direct NYSERDA to prepare a roadmap that would lead to a carbon neutral building stock and across the entire state of New York. Well, here we are a couple of years later. Um, this draft builds on over two years of work at NYSERDA, the hours of many consultants across the country, NBI, RMI, Arab, E3, who have contributed to the research and, uh, and analysis efforts underlying the roadmap. Next slide, please. So the impetus for this work is the need to avoid the worst effects of catastrophic climate change, plain and simple. It's clear that the climate is warming and that New York and New Yorkers are vulnerable to the many effects. It's also clear that the cost of inaction is enormous. We're seeing flooding, heat waves, other extreme weather events. Let's uh, think about bomb cyclones in Central Park, seven feet of snow in Buffalo in one afternoon. And along with these climate disruptions, we have disruptions to ecosystems, biodiversity, food chains, the list goes on and it's really frightening. We need to act and we need to act now. And New York State is doing just that. In fact, New York is committed to the most aggressive clean energy and climate agenda in the United States as codified by our Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which we'll refer to as the Climate Act, and that legislation was passed and signed by the governor in 2019. Next slide. So what does this mean for buildings? Well, it means we have to transform our entire built environment. Uh, the legislation calls for an 85% reduction in economy-wide greenhouse gases by 2050. And we know that fossil fuel combustion in buildings comprises about a third of the state's total direct emissions. If we include indirect emissions, which means the emissions from generation of electricity used in buildings, that percentage rises to over 40%. So reduction in emissions from this sector is a critical piece of reaching New York State's climate goals. Without doing this, we don't get there. And to get there, we need to develop a suite of policy drivers and focused uh, research, 
development and demonstrations with an emphasis on cost reduction and on equity. There will be an upfront capital cost of this transition, but it pales to the cost of inaction that I just referenced. And it needs to be shared in a way that does not increase the energy burdens on low and moderate income customers. There are many ways, thankfully, th that uh, thoughtful policies and programs can reduce the in incremental cost, and we'll be focused on that. Roadmaps policy and solution recommendations include some programs and initiatives that can be taken, uh, undertaken by NYSERDA, but more so it goes much broader and will require partnerships throughout the state and the nation with many other state agencies, the state legislature, local governments, academic institutions, and a broad array of other organizations, and of course, partnership with the private sector. So take a look at this picture here. Um, it's pretty cool. These, these kids are at uh, PS62 in New York City. It's the Kathleen Grimm School for Leadership and Sustainability. Uh, it happens to be a, a really interesting net zero project in and of itself, the school building. But this is this is really a big part of the answer that we're looking at. Uh, these kids are compare. They're using a uh, building emissions dashboard, and they're comparing the emissions from their school building to the emissions of a car. We need a step change here in behavior, and it needs to be pervasive, and reach all aspects of our society. Education is critical, and we can't start the process too young or too early. Next slide. So here's a uh, timeline on our Climate Act. Uh, again, 2050, the target 85% reduction greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels. You also have a 40% milestone along the way in 2030. Uh, a uh, 40% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. You also have the clean energy standard, which requires 70% of our electricity to come from renewable energy by 2030, and 100% of, of uh, our electricity is uh, targeted to be zero emission by 2040. And that's so important because it means that electrification of buildings becomes a decarbonization tool. And then the energy, the electricity used in appliances in those buildings no longer has that indirect emissions component that I mentioned a couple minutes ago. Uh, lots of other milestones on the way. Uh, there's one for uh, storage, for offshore wind. There's also one for energy efficiency, and this is in fact codifying a program called New Efficiency New York and looking for 185 trillion BTUs of end use savings. That's sort of a you know, hard, hard to grasp, but um, what that will do is get us a third of the way to our emissions reductions 40% requirement by 2030. And what it's really doing is kickstarting efficiency. It's tripling the amount of efficiency roughly that we've been procuring um, historically, and we'll have to expand from there, because as you'll see, efficiency must be a really important uh, element that goes along with building electrification. Next, oh, and uh, sorry, the, the, here's the codification of our uh, low to moderate income commitment. The act requires 35% with a goal of 40% of the benefits from the state's clean energy investment to flow to disadvantaged communities. Next slide. So the Climate Act also in included an implementation plan by establishing a Climate Action Council that Doreen mentioned. Uh, it's a 22 member body co-chaired by uh, Doreen Harris at NYSERDA and Basil Segos at the Department of Environmental Conservation but note that the uh, the other agencies that are involved, there are a bunch of appointments from the legislature and the governor, but then you've got 10 other agencies that are represented on this council. And what this shows is the partners, the agency partners that I mentioned before, we all need to integrate uh, this thinking into our, our jobs and our missions to reach the state's climate goals. Uh, the um, so the 
Climate Action Council works across all industries. Uh, it's tasked with developing this scoping plan that will provide recommendations to achieve the state's greenhouse gas targets. Those recommendations will then go to the Department of Environmental Conservation for uh, regulation writing. And by the end of 2023, we should be ready to go with new regulations in place. One of the industry panel, or it was advised, just the, the CAC was advised by a number of industry specific panels, one of which was the um, energy efficiency and housing panel, which focused on actually the entire building sector, not just housing. Uh, and our roadmap uh, helped serve as a foundation for um, that panel's work. Uh, they were able to access the, the research and the modeling that we had done and then take it from there to develop their recommendations. Um, we're largely aligned with our roadmap and the recommendations that came out of that panel. Next slide. So here's a uh, here's just a check in on our clean energy standard, right? We're shooting for 70% renewable energy by 2030. Well, today we're at 27% and the pie chart on the left there shows the composition of today's operating renewables. You'll see that uh, most is hydroelectric, the big uh, hydro plants uh, on uh, at Niagara Falls and the St. Lawrence River. Also small slivers of uh, distributed solar and land based wind. But when you add what we have in our pipeline already under contract or and or in development, uh, that's another 23%. So we will be at 50% when the pipeline is constructed with only another 20% to uh, to go to get to our 70% target. And that the pie chart on the right shows you the composition of the contracted renewables and largely offshore wind, right? 52%, the dark blue. And uh, interesting that the next biggest piece is actually large scale solar, not onshore wind. That's the yellow uh, 28%. So we're on our way. We're confident at NYSERDA that we will achieve the grid decarbonization targets uh, in that they're required by the act. Next slide. So buildings, the end goal is to achieve deep energy efficiency in buildings, all electric, flexible, and grid responsive loads supplied by zero emission electricity. Uh, this is gonna impact the entire state, including all the people building, living, and working in New York's buildings, the people who pay the bills, and the various professionals who design, manage, build, supply homes and businesses. We're calling on all of you to join us in realizing the goals of this roadmap. There are a lot of elements that we need to include here. Uh, I'll hit on a, a couple of them, uh, highlights. Uh, if you look at the top and the bottom bullets there, electrification and supplying the energy loads from zero emission resources, technically, if you achieve those two, you've decarbonized buildings. But you, if you ignore the middle two bullets, we'll do so at a major cost to the electric grid. When we electrify all of our heating in New York State, we will wind up with a, a winter peak demand that is higher than our summer peak demand. But we need to do everything that we can to minimize the increase in peak demand, because that's where the game is in the electric in the, the grid sector, right? The grid is built to meet the capacity required for peak demand. So the more we can shift loads and decrease peak, the less expensive it will be for us to build out the grid that we'll need to keep our electricity um, reasonably priced and reliable. So we must have efficiency, right? Building envelopes to reduce loads, allowing installation of smaller equipment, expanded solar and other distributed energy resources also reduce demand on central grid generation, make it easier to reach our uh, clean energy standard. And shifting loads, we'll, we'll keep coming back and hitting on this, but uh, it's so important to be able to store energy from time to time and run your uh, equipment 
in ways that uh, offset peak demand. So flexibility is critical and we need to allow for varying intensity in building energy use. This is an important point. New York State is not looking to discourage energy use in buildings per se. In fact, we, in many cases, we want to encourage a high energy use intensity, which means we're increasing the density and the use that we're getting out of our buildings, as opposed to um, constructing new buildings. What this is about is avoiding energy waste through efficiency. So we don't wanna make it so it's uh, unpalatable for data centers, uh, trading floors to be in New York. Uh, we want to make them build out the most efficient data centers and training floors that we can, use efficient equipment to avoid energy waste. Um, and then stakeholder feedback is so important. That's you, your colleagues, friends, neighbors. Um, let's hear from you. You'll have a, uh, they'll, they'll get into this later, but you'll have a 45 day period to uh, submit comments. Uh, next slide, please. So let's talk about the scope of our roadmap. It's got a dual purpose. It's intended to serve both as a long-term planning document for the building sector to reach the state's vision of carbon neutrality by mid-century, but it's also looking to be an action plan for what we need to do, what we know how to do, and where we need to start over the next few years. So projections range from 70 to 90% of the buildings that will be in New York State in 2050 are already here today. This is not a big new construction state. So while we do need to focus on new construction and uh, build zero carbon buildings you know, from here forward, we also have to have a heavy emphasis on existing buildings. And electrification is such an important piece of our building decarbonization strategy here in New York that NYSERDA is also working on a companion document called the Building Electrification Roadmap, which will focus on a 10-year time horizon and be looking to accelerate and facilitate heat pump adoption. Um, look for a presentation of preliminary findings from that work sometime this fall. We've been working very closely with that team. So our, uh, our focused modeling and solution set analyses that you'll hear more about tomorrow focused on um, four high priority sectors where we know uh, progress can be made today and that uh, collectively represent over 50% of the state's en building energy use. And those sectors are single family residential, low and mid rise multifamily, low and mid rise office buildings and higher education. And when we say mid-rise, we're modeling up to 20 stories. And within these four sectors, we've modeled the impacts of various measure packages um, on different types of buildings within the sectors, looking at different combinations of uh, electri electrified heating, cooling technologies, together with uh, various envelope measures, then analyzing climate impact, energy reductions, cost effectiveness and uh, grid implications. And you'll get to see some of the solution set modeling results tomorrow. Last point I wanna make about the scope is, is this is not a, a one and done situation here. We, we envision this roadmap as a living document that will be updated every few years to address additional building typologies beyond these four strategic sectors and to um, evolve the thinking as market and tech technology develops over time. Next slide. So when we're thinking about our roadmap, uh, we need to incorporate a number of key areas. So we've already talked about cost a little bit. There are some um, spaces in, in these solutions, some solutions that are already cost effective. Think about uh, distributed energy resources like solar PV. Um, controls that enable load flexibility and grid interactivity are often cost effective today. Electrification is already cost effective in new construction and is on a trajectory to become so in retrofits with appropriate policy support. It's not that far away. 
Um, electrification is also a viable alternative to address customer heating needs in uh, natural gas supply constrained areas. Um, envelope efficiency strategies, similarly, a little more expensive than electrification, but they're often cost effective today in new construction. And they also, we believe, can, can become so in retrofits given proper code and policy support. And then our roadmap aims to identify strategies to reduce costs through things like driving scale, focusing our tech research and development, raising consumer awareness, in other words, driving consumer demand, um, advancing workforce development, lowering the cost of financing, uh, various other tactics, all of which we will delve into over the next couple of days. So the technologies, we're looking primarily at solutions where uh, the technologies exist today off the shelf. We may want to focus on how to reduce the cost of those or, or make them perform better in certain um, conditions, but they're there or they're close and we can see a, a path through research, development, demonstration to get there. But then the roadmap is also looking to find technology gaps. What do we need that we don't have today that could be bridged with focused uh, investment? And so we'll be identifying those as well. Uh, so when you think about technologies, it's about, is it market ready? Um, or is there a path there which we can see can lead to cost reduction and potentially large impacts to figure out where we prioritize our, our work in that area? Policies are, are uh, you know, critically important. They are what will drive scale, um, creating energy savings, resilience, health benefits, avoiding the social cost of carbon. We'll need new policies. We'll need to extend and expand existing policies. You'll hear a lot about policy tomorrow from John Lee. Um, and it's important to recognize that that policies can also catalyze workforce development uh, programs. Next slide. So the other areas, as mentioned, have to have a, a heavy emphasis, you know, that's a little far, have to have a heavy emphasis on prioritizing disadvantaged communities, creating jobs, uh, the 35 to 40% threshold um, from the Climate Act that we mentioned. Um, we have an entire chapter dedicated to uh, disadvantaged communities, so you'll hear a lot about that tomorrow, but the, one of the key parts is including frontline communities and advocates in the decision-making of, of what will happen in those communities, as opposed to uh, just having uh, people in other parts of the state decide what's, what's good for those communities. Um, I've mentioned uh, load flexibility a ton, and it, we will uh, be emphasizing it more. And one of the ideas here is that uh, by reducing building peak loads, not only do you reduce the requirement to build more uh, of the grid, but you also reduce peaker plant operation, which can be some of the dirtiest uh, electricity generation out there today. And then stakeholder engagement, super important. We engage over a thousand people with a wide perspective of viewpoints in getting our roadmap to where it is today. And we, um, will continue to uh, have a, a strong uh, outreach to uh, to stakeholders throughout this process and future events. Once uh, the final roadmap is published, after looking at all of the comments um, late this year, and the Climate Action Council comes out with the scoping plan, we'll work together to get out into the state to inform uh, uh, stakeholders and, and build coalitions to, to drive the action forward. Next slide. And then you can go one more. So the definitions. Um, here's what we came up with. Uh, it's important to ensure that we all mean the same thing when we say carbon neutral building. So we need to take into consideration design, construction, and operations in reducing emissions. Uh, so that says, no on-site combustion for heating or hot water, but rather electrification and electrification and where the electricity is supplied by emission-free sources. But it also goes beyond operational carbon. Now, operational carbon is heavily dependent on building design and construction expertise, 
but by including the word construction in this definition, we're raising the issue of embodied carbon, which we'll be addressing at, at various points going forward in the next couple of days. Next slide. So the attributes of a carbon neutral building, we've really are already hit on the top four there, but we also need to pay attention to resiliency and pay attention to designing um, with low embodied carbon and refrigerants are super important now. HFCs are a, a very strong uh, greenhouse gas that uh, we need to minimize. So as we're looking at these attributes and and trying to figure out how we uh, drive policy goals. You can go to the next slide. Um, we need to make sure that the metrics that we use are practical, that they incorporate market signals that move buildings to cost effective solutions, um, drive flexibility in how buildings, individual buildings can reach the targets. We, there's not a one size fits all. And it's uh, critical to provide transparency in timelines to the market to let the market adapt to uh, upcoming regulations. So the bottom line is that to, to achieve the goals that we have there from the Climate Act on the left side, there is no one metric that rules them all. Uh, this is not Middle Earth. Uh, we think it's important to have a GHG emissions metric for on-site combustion. But then we want to combine that with a metric that is based on energy use intensity. We don't think it's fair to hold building owners responsible for how fast the state decarbonizes the electric grid. So when we're talking about electricity used in buildings, we wanna focus on an efficiency metric, not an emissions metric, but for on-site combustion, we should go straight to an emissions metric. We also need uh, a clear signal of our progress toward decarbonizing the grid, like I showed you earlier in this uh, in the deck. And we need to figure out a way to measure how a building is being grid interactive, right? And there are things underway to get to those metrics. So let's go to the next slide. So this suite of metrics, um, we need to work on building it out, right? So optimizing the peak load flexibility, uh, there's a project called Grid Optimal that New Buildings Institute is leading to develop a metric that essentially measures how much energy a building uses when the grid is in the top 5% of its annual system peak. So then you could score that and essentially um, measure how well a building is equipped for load flexibility and how they are operating to actually use that flexibility to avoid uh, peak demand. We need metrics on embodied carbon. There are a few new ones coming out um, in the last year or two. Uh, one of the more familiar is called EC3 that was developed by uh, uh, Microsoft and a professor at the University of Washington, I believe Skanska had a role in that, um, that, that basically can compare the embodied carbon in various materials when you're selecting how to build your building. I learned of a, a, a sort of an advancement to that metric uh, just this last weekend. Um, the North American Passive House Network is working on uh, adapting a new metric from Europe to uh, the United States, which actually takes the low embodied carbon materials metric and combines it into operational carbon metric, which is really the way you have to look at it because they're so uh, interdependent. So that's encouraging. We also need to develop metrics for uh, refrigerants and prevention of refrigerant leaks. So now just a quick run through of our buildings today. Next slide. And then you can actually go to. So, I mean, the bottom line here is we got a lot of different buildings and we have a lot of buildings, right? So here's the, the diverse mix, right? We've got three different climate zones. We've got a wide disparity between the urban density of downstate and the rural nature of upstate. 
So that leads to a, a ton of different buildings with different characteristics. You know, downstate, the cost of real estate and the cost of uh, construction and the cost of most everything is uh, significantly higher. We also have a higher percentage of lease space, which leads to the split incentive issue being a, a significant barrier here in New York City and also uh, lots of very tall buildings, um, which are hard to figure out. Uh, the converse with the uh, upstate buildings sort of um, less concentrated density, but uh, a lot of buildings. So the next slide. Uh, we already talked about this 30% of uh, economy wide emissions come from the direct emissions from. Our building stock, and that's both through uh, combustion of uh, fossil fuel and also um, HFCs from refrigeration. So if you look at the dark blue uh, wedge of that pie, that's direct emissions from buildings. And if you look at the green, that's the electricity um, emissions. And most electricity today is used in buildings. So if you combine those two, you're pretty close to 50%. Next slide. This is just a little breakdown of uh, how those emissions uh, are, are uh, made up between residential and commercial. You see the larger share of emissions are residential and uh, the larger share by fuel type is uh, gas versus oil. And then on the right, various um, elements of uh, using combustion in a, in a building from space heating, single family, multifamily are the, are the two biggest ones um, and commercial space heating as well. Next slide. So our building stock, like Doreen said, over 6 million buildings, 6.2 to be roughly exact. That's uh, almost 5 million single family homes and over 600,000 multifamily and commercial institutional buildings. This shows the scale that's needed. From 2030 onward, we have to be upgrading over 200,000 homes per year to be all electric and energy efficient. By 2050, we will have had to have gotten to the vast majority of over 600,000 commercial institutional and multifamily buildings to cut their energy use in half and end fossil fuel use. That's why I say this has to be a step change. This has to be just business as usual over the next 30 years. And we need to leverage the right points in a building life cycle to minimize the cost and to minimize disruption to building occupants. It's all about behavior change. Next slide. So again, these are our four uh, priority building types and um, uh, about 50% of all building energy use in New York State representing represented by these building typologies. And then, uh, just to make things a little more complicated, go to the next slide. Uh, we have campuses and communities, right, that work on district energy systems. Um, these are these have pros and cons. Uh, by doing it this way, centralizing the system, it allows for trading efficiency among buildings and loads, um, and you can achieve efficiencies that you can't. Uh, in, in localized systems because of the energy sources used, the types of equipment, the savings in operation and maintenance. Um, and many, many uh, central plants uh, utilize the waste heat of uh, creating that energy to in, a, in and of itself to uh, heat and cool buildings. That's cogeneration. Um, however, many of uh, the college central heating plants and the Con Ed um, district heating system in New York City work on steam um, and they're using natural gas or other fossil fuels to create and distribute steam to buildings on the system. So that's a super uh, challenging area to figure out how to decarbonize. So that's the end of my uh, my intro today and I uh, pass it on to Mikal who's going to talk to you about technologies. Great. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, let's see, let's go to the next slide. One more, slide 34, there we go. Okay, so many of the technologies that we need are available today. 
Um, these are technologies that build on decades of efficiency and clean energy investment. Um, and they're already in widespread use in Europe and Canada. So we know that we're not starting from scratch here. So in Europe, government policies have been a huge driver of market adoption. And in Canada, the lower price of electricity has made these options more attractive. Um, so through this effort and others, we're gonna be working to bring these technologies to New York and to make them widely available. Uh, there are a number of reasons why these technologies haven't taken off in the US as they have elsewhere. Um, these include project economics, difficulty of penetrating existing markets, regulatory barriers, customer and contractor preferences for what they know, and also labor concerns. Um, so what we're trying to achieve for both new construction and existing buildings is to create buildings with robust thermal shells. These are buildings that are heated and cooled by heat pumps with energy recovery ventilation, with electric water heating and cooking, and with appliances outfitted with grid connected energy management controls. Um, investing in these technologies and their implementation is critical to both achieving scale and demonstrating market demand to manufacturers. Next slide. Okay, um, so for the technology centered solutions, there are four primary outcomes we're looking to achieve. So the first is cost reduction. Um, examples of this are battery storage and electrification systems where technology advancements over the next decade are expected to significantly reduce costs. Um, and there are some technologies which are not cost effective in isolation, but can be bundled for improved product economics and performance. Um, for improved uh, performance, improved COP or coefficient of performance of heat pumps is one example of better performance of a technology that we're uh, seeking to achieve. Um, minimize disruption, we'll be looking for strategies that minimize the disruption to tenants and those who are actually in the space. Um, and uh, availability of lower emission choices, so refrigerants and, and embodied carbon um, are really gonna be a critical aspect in addition to operational carbon as Greg mentioned. Next slide. Okay, so there are four primary um, priority solution sets to achieve carbon neutrality, energy efficiency, electrification, controls, and distributed, distributed energy resources. So this chart reflects the corresponding technologies for each solution set. Next slide. Okay, so bolded technologies indicate priorities for innovation and product development that will make these technologies better. Um, and cheaper to use and manufacture. So some specific technologies we wanna focus on, um, building envelope system solutions, a key aspect of cost-effective implementation. Um, they're gonna reduce total building energy use from heating and cooling equipment and improve comfort. Air sealing is a high value strategy for all building types. Uh, high performance fenestration includes high performance windows and doors. Thinner triple pane windows are now commercially available and address some of the major concerns related to retrofitting old single pane windows and those with small form factors, uh, panelized facade products that are constructed offsite and installed with minimal onsite work to provide a high performance building envelope, um, central or, ter or terminal air source heat pumps. Um, these have the ability to provide both heating and cooling. Um, ground source heat pump system uses a heat pump and a heat transfer liquid to transfer heat between the ground and the interior building space for both space heating and cooling. Variable refrigerant flow systems use piped refrigerants to heat and cool indoor spaces. Uh, In-unit uh, heat pump water heaters can be used both for smaller building types and for centralized, um, for larger building types via centralized systems. Uh, induction cooking heats by transferring currents from an electromagnetic field located below the glass surface directly to the magnetic induction cookware placed above. Uh, smart controls paired with a building energy management system. This allows building owners and operators to see and control their building's energy use. Batteries and energy storage allow energy to be stored on site for later use to shift peak and to provide power during outage events. Um, and then also PV systems. Uh, these are most often on the rooftop or ground mounted and are particularly effective when combined with battery storage. Next slide. Um, and I'm actually going to pass it over to Kara to talk about cost. Great. Great. Thanks, McCall. 
Um, so RMI and Arup reached out to industry and conducted around 20 interviews to understand the cost reduction potential of these key decarbonization technologies out to 2040. Um, and our analysis showed upfront costs will come down over the next 20 years on average by about 35% with some technologies coming down um, by as much as 65%. So this is really good news since this is gonna make decarbonization efforts more cost effective. So this chart mapped out in five year intervals, um, which are shown in different colors and the percentages represent the reduction in first costs of those technologies. Um, and then the gray dots represent the innovation threshold, which is the outer bound of potential cost reduction that we found. So the technologies with the biggest cost reduction potential are integrated mechanical systems, uh, prefabricated panelized solutions and heat pump water heaters. And while this chart shows data for retrofits, new construction offers a slightly better cost reduction in air source heat pumps and fenestration. Uh, but by and large, uh, it was really pretty similar. Next slide, please. Um, so to double click on one of the more promising technologies where there's a need to drive cost reduction is in ground source heat pumps, um, which we found on the previous slide could have a 25% lower upfront costs by 2030. So NYSERDA's publication, uh, Patterns and Trends, indicates that as of 2014, only 1% of statewide residential load is met with solar and geothermal. But the heating and cooling framework estimates that ground source heat pumps could technically meet 58% of the state's HVAC load. So there's a big difference in where we are today and where we could go. Um, one other aspect to note is the great progress we've seen in recent years around emerging energy as a service financing um, that can shift the upfront cost burden of these decarbonization technologies to an operating expense, which lowers barrier to entry um, and also enables costs to be shared more easily with tenants and occupants. Uh, next slide and back to you, McCall. Okay, great. Thanks, Kara. Okay, so um, improved performance. So for heat pumps, um, highly efficient technology uh, for providing heating and cooling in place of fossil sources. There are a number of commercially available options. Uh, heat pumps can work at or below negative 10 degrees, some with a coefficient of performance of 1.5 a days with negative 13 degrees. Um, these are still better than resistance heating and negative temperatures, but ongoing development is, is needed to improve the performance and lower operating expenses. Um, another approach is to use air sealing and modest amounts of insulation in conjunction with heat pump installation to lower heating cooling demand and to make up um, to make the project more cost effective. Next slide. Okay, minimizing disruption. So several technologies that have been utilized to allow for retrofits that minimize occupant disruption um, or tenant displacement. Uh, both panelized retrofits and integrated mechanical systems are the focus of NYSERDA's Retrofit New York program, which aims to lower the cost of retrofits uh, to existing buildings. And it's based on the Dutch Energy Strong model, and it enables tenants to actually stay in the residence while the exterior of the building is retrofitted. Um, it happens relatively quickly. You can um, get a sense of it in the, the photo here. Next slide. So um, another important technology area of focus that, that uh, Greg mentioned uh, earlier is embodied carbon. So embodied carbon is the carbon footprint associated with the extraction, manufacturing, transportation, installation, and end of life handling of materials and equipment. Uh, really, you know, based on a life cycle analysis, um, it's estimated that half of the emissions from new buildings constructed between 2020 and 2050 will come from embodied carbon. So this is a, a super important area for us to focus on. Um, next slide. When, when we think of ways to reduce embodied carbon, what's not used is really important. So reusing existing buildings or building materials, adaptive use of existing materials and recycling of materials are really the best option for reducing the embodied carbon of a building. Um, otherwise, examples of low embodied carbon options include 
things like mass timber for building construction in place of steel and concrete. So mass timber um, has a 4x reduction in embodied carbon compared to steel and concrete. Um, Off-site fabrication of, of mass timber products decreases construction time and cost on site. And it's often lighter weight than concrete, which can help reduce costs in the building design stage. Um, other examples are low carbon concrete designs and, and concrete products, products that reduce the amount of cement used in a building are very effective. Um, hempcrete shown here has a high insulating value and sequesters carbon in the form of hemp in addition to displacing high carbon materials. Um, and some insulation products are bio-based or made from natural fibers, and these can also sequester more carbon than is emitted in their manufacturing. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, so for global, low global warming potential refrigerants, really the main concern about use of refrigerants and heating and cooling systems is that the systems will leak, uh, releasing harmful refrigerant that is an incredibly powerful greenhouse gas. So as you lose refrigerant through the leaks, the efficiency of the system decreases and the emissions of the system increase. Um, there are two approaches to address this. The first is to reduce leaks in equipment, and then the second is to use more environmentally friendly refrigerant. So um, there may be opportunities to reduce leakage through leak monitoring and mitigation. Um, leak detection is historically difficult, but there is an opportunity to move the needle here. Um, and for low GWP refrigerants, Several options currently exist, but they don't yet have the functionality or range of properties of refrigerants currently in use. So more research is needed to develop these options. Um, it's also worth noting that the refrigerant industry tends to move as a whole and is dominated by several large players. So getting them to develop improved low GWP refrigerants is really what's needed here. Okay, so um, with that, I will say next slide and pass it on to Dan Oss. Great. Great. Thank you very much. I'm really excited about the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, can we advance to the next slide, please? So as Greg laid out in the beginning of the presentation, buildings have a really important role in New York's energy system. And building heating loads in particular have a very large role, being the second largest source of energy consumption in the state after transportation. Today, the sources of heating energy in New York are primarily from fossil fuels, with natural gas being the largest single source. Electrification is a focus of the roadmap in order to decarbonize those building heating demands, but given New York's heating dominated, dominated climate, the impacts of building electrification on the grid become a very important consideration. That's what we're gonna be focusing on to a large extent today. Though I'll note there'll be a deeper dive on building electrification across a variety of different considerations in the building electrification roadmap. Uh, which will take more of a 10 year time horizon. We'll be looking at a little bit further here. Next slide, please. Switching to heat pumps will save greenhouse gas emissions in New York, but will add substantial new loads to the state's electricity system, particularly on peak. The magnitude of electric grid impacts depends to a large extent on what electrification technologies are deployed and to what extent energy efficiency and demand flexibility are implemented alongside them. What this figure shows are several different peak demand scenarios for New York State in 2050, assuming high levels of building electric electrification. The y-axis are in gigawatts, so that's a unit of electric capacity, and the x-axis shows different scenarios for peak demands, uh, with the two on the left being a comparison of the peak demand in summer in 2018 and in winter in 2018, and the right three scenarios that look out to 2050 with different mixtures of heat pump technologies and energy efficiency measures. I'll focus your attention first to far this right bar, which is a scenario with large scale adoption of cold climate heat pumps, but no shell improvements. You can see in that scenario, we have a very large increase in the peak demand of the state. Um, but we can also see that that peak demand can be reduced substantially through a combination of building shell improvements. That's a figure second from the right, uh, as well as portfolios of measures that use a diverse set of technologies, including ground source heat pumps, dual fuel systems and load flexibility. And that middle bar shows what a more of a portfolio approach uh, to building electrification in New York could look like and the much reduced impact on peak demand that it would result in. It's important to note, however, that in all cases, as Greg noted as well, New York is expected to become a winter peaking electricity system with a switchover occurring most likely between 2030 and 2040 if the state is on path for the CLCPA level of electrification considered. Next slide, please. So 
it's important to think about the different impacts of electrification. And I just went through peak demand impacts on the previous slide. Uh, but there's also important implications just of the level of load and the shape of the load uh, on the New York electricity system. And really the magnitude and shape of load will determine the portfolio of electric generation resources required to achieve those electric sector decarbonization goals. So we'll be adding more heating energy, more electric energy in the morning, uh, which will imply a different set of resources than say a summer peaking system today. Uh, but it's also important to note that grid impacts are not the only impacts that matter. Uh, and again, these will be discussed in greater detail in the building electrification roadmap, but for instance, cost and technical feasibility are important considerations. So for example, forced air systems and domestic hot water heaters will perhaps be easier to electrify from a technical and cost standpoint than buildings with perimeter radiant heat. Uh, cost reduction, continued improvements in equipment performance uh, and moving existing solutions to scale could help mitigate some of those cost and technical issues. And so coming to some of those, some of those dynamics between technical improvements, cost reductions, and the challenges of certain applications in the state will be a further consideration. Uh, and then finally, as Mikhail noted, careful invitation will be necessary to ensure that greenhouse gas savings are not negated or reduced through use of high global warming potential refrigerants and heat pumps, uh, even though today with those refrigerants, switching to heat pumps still saves greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. I'm going to go briefly into some of the limits of electrification and areas where continued research is needed to, to find solutions. And if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that while energy efficiency and electrification represent the primary pathways to decarbonize New York's building stock, not all building type apologies and building energy demands can be readily electrified for both technical and economic reasons. So there are several building types that we know will be challenging to electrify. These include very tall buildings, buildings with high temperature process loads, and central steam plants and district energy systems. In addition, there are likely existing buildings for which the cost of electrification and envelope improvements will exceed the going forward value of the building due to space limitations, code requirements, materials used in the original buildings, or the building's condition today. However, an asserted work is actively working to find solutions for these types of buildings. And there are some encouraging efforts underway that will come out in future talks. Next slide, please. But for some buildings, there may be a role for low carbon fuels as one amongst the many different solutions for these hard to electrify buildings. And when I say low carbon fuels, that includes things like hydrogen that replace on site fuel fossil fuel combustion in hard to electrify buildings and perhaps biofuels that are subject to the accounting conventions of the New York State uh, CLCPA. Additional research is required to understand the technolog technological viability, commercial scalability, economic competitiveness, and sustainability of these fuels. And as part of the Climate Action Council work, alternative and low carbon fuels will be assessed for consideration as part of the council's broader economy-wide scoping plan due at the end of the year. With that, I'll advance to the next slide and hand it off to Amanda Stevens. Great, thank you, Dan. Uh, next slide, please. So similar to how Greg spoke earlier about defining carbon neutral buildings, it's also important to establish a common definition for resilient buildings. And when we're talking about resilience for buildings, we're not just talking about the building itself, but the people who use it. Um, so a resilient building needs to protect the health, safety, and comfort of building occupants from shocks and stresses, including power outages, impacts of extre extreme storm events, and extreme temperatures. Next slide. So, so here are some uh, three types of resilience we can think about. Um, passive survivability of the occupants, uh, functioning when the grid is down, and being able to ride out extreme weather events. So a truly resilient building um, is able to provide safe and functional building conditions during a power outage. Um, so that the, the occupants, uh, again, stay safe um, throughout those outages. And those are through passive means like insulation, um, passive solar heating or natural ventilation. Um, functioning active systems uh, might be necessary, such as through solar with battery storage or other backup power. Um, and then again, occupant safety is really important, um, but particularly during extreme weather events like floods or hurricanes. Next slide, please. So some general considerations when we're thinking about resilient design of buildings in general. 
Um, strategies that improve resilience can be cost effective over the life cycle of a building by avoiding costs from damage. So the buildings last longer and that in itself saves money, materials and avoided embodied carbon. And many of these strategies also have the co-benefit of any of energy efficiency or vice versa. A lot of energy efficiency uh, strategies have resilience co-benefits and that um, save additional money through energy reduction above and beyond the, the pure resilience um, uh, cost savings. Uh, and then when we're designing for climate resiliency, uh, we need to account for the lifespan of each system and its suitability for future climate conditions. So different building systems and different components have different lifespans. So they should be designed for the climate conditions that will be encountered during their individual lifespans. If you're talking about the building structure itself, for example, um, that may well be there for you know decades for sure, um, maybe a century even. So it should be designed for the long haul. Uh, but if a particular system within that building is likely only to be in service for 15 years, say, before it needs to be replaced, looking out 15 to 20 years may be sufficient um, with a plan to reevaluate the conditions at the time of replacement. Uh, resilient buildings are flexible and should not be viewed in isolation, but they need to be a part of a number of strategies to create a broader resilient community. Uh, things like stormwater management, management microgrid, microgrids, places of refuge, all of these make for a more, more resilient community in which the building is located. Next slide. Here's some illustrated examples of what a resilient single family building might look like. Um, proper building and orientation. Uh, this could contribute to passive heat gain through windows to help interior spaces uh, heat up in the winter and also re reduce mechanical heating needs. Uh, but ideally it should also be oriented with the natural landscape like tree shading uh, to provide passive cooling in the summer. Uh, tight envelopes and thermal mass can help moderate temperature uh, and reduce heating and cooling needs. High performance windows provide thermal comfort and also natural ventilation uh, potentially um, during those um, power outages when these passive uh, strategies are needed. And the solar, pl solar plus storage systems then provide backup power during an outage. Um, also contribute to reduced utility reliance, allow for load shifting when grid demand is high, like during a heat wave. And then um, the example here, mechanical equipment is elevated to reduce potential damage from flooding. Next slide. So building on those examples, here are some key resilience strategies for resilient buildings. Um, siting, as we mentioned, uh, again, both away from potential damage zones like flood zones um, and also building orientation. Uh, insulated building envelopes and operable windows for both temperature regulation and natural ventilation, uh, which also contributes to improved air quality indoors. Uh, solar and storage for backup and grid flexibility. Uh, smart control systems for islanding, which is being disconnected from the grid or to reduce load on constrained systems. Next slide. Um, another potential strategy to think about is on-site flood walls to stop water from damaging the building. Although I do want to point out that these would need to be implemented with care and with an understanding of where that water is going to go instead. We don't want to flood out the neighbors by just kind of protecting our building. So that kind of goes back to the resilient community thinking as well. Um, again, placing key mechanical equipment up out of the way of potential damage bracing and anchoring to prevent damage to building equipment and making use of natural landscapes like tree cover and veget vegetation for passive cooling. Next slide. As I mentioned briefly earlier, the benefits from employing resilient strategies can be pretty big. Um, FEMA research suggests a benefit cost ratio of six to one for spending proactively on resiliency measures versus the damage costs in the future. Um, essentially, you get more bang for your buck than when those resilience measures also have energy efficiency or other energy reduction benefits as well. Uh, Matt, I'm going to send it back to you. Great. Thanks, Amanda. Appreciate you doing that. And thanks to all the speakers today for doing a great job. If we could go to the next slide, please. And here's the part of the presentation where we say uh, we need to hear from you. 
Um, as Greg indicated, this is an all hands on deck uh, endeavor. Uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions by decarbonizing the built environment is a shared responsibility and effort. It's important that we hear from you on all of our current efforts to inform the development of the final carbon neutral buildings roadmap and our work going on today. We ask that you take the time after these presentations to submit your comments and feedback through the carbon neutral buildings uh, roadmap webpage. You can submit comments at any time after the conclusion of this presentation through August 6th. Presentation deck is currently available on the webpage for you to reference as you submit your comments and the recording will be available later this week uh, if you would like to review the presentation again. Next slide, please. And staying informed, we, we ask everybody and encourage everybody to follow the NYSERDA social media platform uh, to receive continued updates about the roadmap and various projects demonstrating progress towards the state's climate goals. We will alert anyone who's following our roadmap um, through social media challenges um, and, and uh, when you can opt in to, uh, to submit comments. Um, if you or who may be in Next slide, please. Uh, thank you to all of those who have already submitted questions through the Q&A function on WebEx. We're gonna use the rest of the time uh, that we have with you here today to, uh, to go ahead and answer some of those questions. And we encourage others to go ahead and continue submitting additional questions. So I'll go ahead and uh, submit the first question here. Um, first one that we received is, what role would building certification programs play in the roadmap for providing additional assurance? And what role will offsets play, if any, in this roadmap so far? Um, Greg, do you wanna uh, come back on video and audio and, and help us with that answer? But I wasn't raising my hand, Matt. Just kidding. Uh, I'd love to. Um, so the answer is uh, yes. We believe certification programs do have an important role to play. Um, we'll be driving requirements through codes and standards, but we will be working on programs to develop uh, labeling and certification. like. New York City has rolled out its uh, labeling for commercial buildings. It's uh, probably needs a little more tweaking to get it just right, but it's on it's on the way. And you'll you'll hear from uh, from us tomorrow in our policy section of uh, you know how we think that benchmarking and certification at uh, particularly at uh, point of sale disclosure, all of those things are going to be critical. And and no, we, we're not really looking for offsets in the uh, in the building sector, um, we're, we are acknowledging, like Dan said, that some of the buildings will be harder to electrify than others. So there may be alternatives, like in, in some of these very difficult cases of using um, low carbon fuels or other solutions. But we're not looking to just have uh, people buy offsets that uh, create wind farms someplace. You're on mute, Matt. Um, next question here is, how does definition of zero carbon buildings compare to the forthcoming definition being developed by the US EPA? Sounds like we might have uh, lost Greg's audio for a second here, but... Um, Given our existing building stock and the number of uh, tall buildings we have in New York, we're, we're really focused on eliminating fossil fuel uh, site emissions as we build out our renewable grid. Um, where we land on, on building typology support, um, you know, we, we certainly encourage net zero energy buildings, and I, I think that's actually the, the definition that's being referenced here, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, but um, carbon neutrality, carbon neutral buildings, is actually uh, cl more closely aligned with New York State policy than, than trying to require everybody to, to achieve full net zero energy performance. 
So um, I think that's the answer for that question. I'll move on to the next one here. Um, will health impacts of fossil fuel combustion be considered in prior prioritizing or incentivizing the electrification options? Um, in other words, will we consider social costs of pollution or carbon as well as um, other impacts of health? Um, Patrick, uh, this one might be a good one to, to go over to you. Are you available to come online for me? Sure, I can I can come online. Well, we're early in that work. We actually have some healthy home pilots and other pilots that are looking to quantify. Hopefully, we can monetize the health benefits of fossil fuel-free buildings and communities. But as I said, we're early in that work. We'll talk to it tomorrow when we talk about the health aspects of decarbonizing buildings. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Site equivalent per KWH. What will NYSERDA do to move uh, towards standardized time-based greenhouse gas emissions rather than the currently used default egret factors? Um, Greg? Are you able to uh, help respond to this? Uh, I should be able to, can you hear me? Good. Um, well, this is, this is mostly a, uh, a question for our, our grid team or we're the buildings team, so I'm by no means an expert here. But uh, we, it, as part of the work, what's called the integration analysis that's gonna happen through the Climate Action Council for the rest of this year in developing the scoping plan, we're going to be looking at sort of the integrated uh, picture. So they will be deciding what, what metrics to use and, and how to make that transparent. I, I, I will say that New York is not as laser focused on figuring out hourly and locational emissions uh, profiles of energy use, uh, marginal energy use, because we're so we're, we're convinced we're going to get to the renewable electricity goals, um, the clean energy standard of 70% by 2030, 100% by 2040. So this has the a risk of, of being um, kind of a driving false precision, uh, where what we really need to do is figure out how not to overload the electric system. So we're thinking about how we can get real time information to building owners about peak demand, um, but that's more in the uh, the focus so far has been more heavily on um, the energy use rather than the emissions. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Greg. My audio a little bit more clear now, Greg? Yep. Okay, great. So next question is, I suggest that it's true that New York has relatively low heat pump penetration, but in the South, 78% of new construction uses heat pumps uh, according to the 2017 census. So perhaps it's more regional than national. Um, Kara, I'm wondering if uh, as a national expert and can lend some national perspective to this response, if you'd be able to go ahead and come online and help us respond to that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think that's a really promising stat, 78% um, of new construction. And I think that um, aligns with the direction that we as a buildings industry need to go in New York and beyond. Um, heat pumps are kind of emerging as the, the best solution to electrify our buildings in a smart way. And as several folks noted in the presentation before, the costs are coming down for heat pump technologies. So, um, they they can do more um, than what we're currently seeing here, and I think they're proving to work really well in cold uh, cold conditions as well. 
Um, so it's promising for from both a new construction construction perspective as well as a retrofit perspective. Great, thanks, Kara. Um, next question we have is about wastewater heat recovery. The question is, why isn't wastewater heat recovery one of the priority technologies? Up to 20% of the heating demand for a multifamily building is for domestic hot water, and most of that heat is flushed down the drain after minimal use. Why not recycle that heat? Um, Patrick, is, uh, are you able to come online and help us respond to that? Sure, and there was another question about heat recovery as well. So for certain building typologies, heat recovery is a key part of the strategy. I know we didn't emphasize it in today's presentation. Uh, in addition, uh, when you come to wastewater, there are some considerations that you need to make if you are taking too much heat out of wastewater, and I'm not really talking about a building level, but a system level then you interfere with the water treatment system. However, you can take some heat out of that water and not waste it. And also post-treatment, there is another place to recover uh, heat from the, from the water. And there's some technologies that are available in Europe that would do that. So we are looking at heat recovery. We're looking at it in a couple of different ways. Right, that's an important point. It's not just at the building level, but it is at the system level. And our clean heating and cooling team is is very focused on district um, heating and cooling and the potential of tapping into uh, wastewater. We're we're definitely uh, exploring that. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Greg. Um, Next question up is a, a question that is looking at uh, some of the numbers. Have these numbers taken into account the dramatic increase in materials? So, Matt, I'll, I'll pick that question up and then Greg can fill in. So, we recently have a lot of inflation related to construction materials. Some of that is supply chain related. Some of it is energy price related. As long as those material costs remain high, it is gonna have an overall impact on the amount of construction that occurs. That is a very different and number of projects to go forward. That's a very different question than whether carbon neutral investments have a net higher cost than traditional investments. So um, in some cases, we believe in new construction uh, that there actually would not be a negative impact from the way that current prices are going. But, um, and the other side I would say is as energy prices go up, it does make the economics of individual carbon neutral projects better. So it's a mixed bag, harder, it costs more to finance a project because the projects are more expensive. There's some dampening because of that price increase, but there also are potentially greater benefits with this type of investment. Yeah, and we also don't know how long this is going to last. I think everybody uh, agrees that the the direct cause is, is primarily pandemic related. I don't think anybody thinks it will go back all the way to where it was before, but I think that the prevailing view is that uh, the magnitude of this spike will be relatively short lived. Um, and there's also the point of when we're thinking about incremental cost, when we're doing our modeling, we're, we're looking at the incremental cost of a decarbonized solution um, versus a business as usual renovation. So the, uh, you know, price spikes would hit both, so that would minimize the impact on the incremental cost. Not saying it would eliminate it, but it would minimize it. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Patrick. I think this next question might be uh, best handled by Dan Oss from our consultant team. For the 2050 New York State building heating peak demand scenario, what is the uh, HSPF of heat pumps. You may need a hybrid approach of highest performance heat pumps and shell retrofits. Dan, are you able to help us answer that question? Yes, of course. 
So the figures shown to the furthest right, the one with the largest peak demand impacts were uh, modeled consistent with technologies listed on the NEEP cold climate product specification. So it wasn't tied to one particular product, but more of a portfolio of different cold climate air source heat pumps that might be adopted. Uh, so fair to say a very efficient heat pump for what's on the market today. Um, to the point about Shell, we did model scenarios where there are building Shell retrofits. Uh, and that was the sort of second column on that figure I showed and Shell measures do indeed substantially reduce peak demand impacts on the electricity system. Uh, and then finally, we also uh, looked to a case where the performance of cold weather, uh, the cold weather performance of air source heat pumps improves over time. So there were some downward arrows on that figure uh, folks want to refer back to it that essentially show a, a world in which the COP of a heat pump during, during very cold weather uh, is higher than it would be even on um, sort of the typical systems listed on the NEEP specification and more like some of the higher performing systems that are on the market today. Great, thanks Dan. And as long as we got you on video, actually, if you don't mind coming back, uh, I think the next question might also be uh, a good one for you to take a crack at. Um, it reads, given the ground, horse heat, uh, ground source heat pumps produce much lower winter peak demand than air source heat pumps, why are we encouraging installation of air source heat pumps? Um, I can maybe just speak to, to what we modeled and then I'll let someone from NYSERDA just maybe expand a little bit more on the role of ground source heat pumps in the state strategy. but. In terms of the modeling, we did consider the role of ground source heat pumps in that middle column, which was our portfolio solution that balanced uh, more efficient air source heat pumps, dual fuel systems, and ground source heat pumps. And um, indeed, the questioner's uh, point is, is, is correct that those ground source heat pumps do lead to a, a substantially lower impact on the electricity system. Uh, maybe I'll hand it over to Nasser to, to, to talk a little bit more about other considerations, um, but to me, it's just a question of, of how much you spend on the building side to mitigate those peak impacts versus how much additional grid infrastructure you're willing to add in order to serve new loads. Thanks, Dan. Um, Greg, is there anything you'd like to add to, to Dan's response or? Uh, just that, you know, it's it's not a choice of uh, ground source versus air source heat pumps. We need to electrify. Uh, we need all technologies. We love ground source heat pumps. We love air source heat pumps. Uh, we've got to improve the cost versus performance of both, mainly focusing on cost on the ground source and improving performance in, in colder uh, temperatures for air source, but but we're certainly not um, trying to say uh, we should just use air source heat pumps. Um, they make sense in certain applications and in others uh, ground source heat pumps do, and of course have a, a lower impact on the, uh, on the grid when we do use ground source. Great, Thank thanks Greg. Um, another one uh, probably to lead off from the research team was a similar analysis performed of the peak electric uh, demand using ground source heat pump. Since that technology will not have the same constraint of air source heat pumps capacity, B rating with OAT and a need for other source or supplemental heat during those periods. Um, Dan, I may ask you to, to come back online and, and see if you can help lead off our response to that. Yeah. But if I'm understanding correctly, the question seems quite similar to the last one. Um, and yes, we did consider ground source heat pumps as part of a portfolio of options um, where, you know, approximately, I think it was 30% of the building stock uh, adopts a ground source heat pump by 2050. Um, and so that, that was viewed as part of the portfolio solutions in that lower impact on the grid scenario that I presented. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, next question, or it's more of a comment actually, but it says there are conventional products uh, that can meet the needs of very tall buildings. There are steam heat pumps even. Um, Patrick, uh, do you want to come back online and talk to us maybe a little bit about the uh, Empire State Buildings Challenge? Sure, so, I mean, I personally am aware of an industrial to steam heat pump uh, that's offered by a German fir firm. I am unaware of any uh, applications of that technology uh, in the United States. 
Under the Empire Building Challenge, which we launched earlier this year, we are in the process of putting together a uh, $10 million of funding for uh, firms with technology, global technology to bring to New York and another $40 million into demonstrations of that technology. So we are trying to bring the best global technology into the New York market. I don't know enough about the specifics of, of um, steam, heat steam, steam pumps uh, to know how the economics and uh, performance fit the New York requirements. Okay, thanks, and I'll encourage again if if we uh, answer some questions incompletely to go ahead and have encourage everybody to submit your questions via the online uh, interactive form. Um, this next question I, I think might be best uh, responded by Amanda. If I can ask Amanda to come online, it says one issue that comes up again and again relative to resiliency is how to assess its economic value. What's the value of a home staying warm enough to survive a three-day power outage in the middle of winter? FEMA statistic is six to one is compelling, but how can landlords calculate cost savings from disaster avoidance to justify a retrofit? Is NYSERDA considering ways to quantify the economic value of resiliency? Amanda, are you yeah, able so, to help us respond to that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, sort of. <laughs> we don't have a good answer for us for this at this time, uh, but we do acknowledge that it's extremely important. Um, so, NYSERDA will be working on ways to calculate these benefits, including the benefits that are mon non monetary as, as you know, as you kind of mentioned, like, how do you. How do you figure out the value of, of somebody staying warm to survive? Um, so, we understand that there are not these non monetary benefits that are really difficult to quantify. Uh, so, we will be working on you know, trying to figure out how to calculate and or present that information. Great, thanks, Amanda. Um, I think this next one might also be a good one for Dan related to some of the modeling. Um, how is NYSERDA addressing the effects of continued increase in cooling degree days on the 28% of LMI customers without cooling? Actually, that, that one might not be a Dan question though that I read a little more carefully. Greg, maybe I'll ask you to, to come in and help us uh, respond to that one. Sure, uh, you know, the, the... First answer is electrify those heating loads with heat pumps, which of course can provide cooling in the summer. And that's a really important reason why uh, electrification is critical there. Um, as we are rolling that out, and, and yes, we are doing all of our modeling going forward, thinking about what the climate is going to be, not what it is today, right? We need to plan for the future. Um, and during the interim period, while we're rolling out the electrification, the installation of heat pumps in the uh, low to moderate income sector, uh, we may need to uh, integrate community cooling centers into the solution set. Um, they already have some in, in New York City. We may, may need to expand those, but uh, it's a very important question and, and we need to get cooling to those individuals as quickly as possible. Thanks, Craig. Um, I think the next question uh, might be a good one for Patrick to lead off our response with. It reads, uh, what, will, what will the challenges be with regard to the Con Ed steam system and decarbonization of that utility system? Patrick, are you able to help us uh, respond to that? Sure, so Con Ed is under a way to study the long-term future of the steam system the STEAM system presents us with some unique problems. And one of the biggest problems is uh, the amount of space in the buildings that are connected to the STEAM system uh, are, it, are incredibly small in terms of the areas that are designated where normally equipment would be. The STEAM connections take up hardly any space. So you do have some challenges. We don't think it's best for each building to try to solve the Con Ed steam system, but rather for the state to work towards a long-term solution, whether that solution is a steam system running on uh, biofuels or a steam system running with biogas or a steam system that somehow uh, continues but generates or a steam system 
decommissioned on a schedule. It's really unclear at this point in time uh, what the solution is. It was not, it was identified as something that's difficult to sell, but uh, we did not believe that there was a uh, clear solution at this point in the development of the carbon neutral roadmap. Great, thanks Patrick. Uh, Greg, I think this next one might be a good one for you to lead off our response. It, it reads, how will the dynamic real estate market in upstate and uh, the price increases in, in cost be taken into account in the planning process? Well, this goes uh, kind of to the, the point I made before that um, you, I don't think we should be planning around the current state of materials costs. I think we need to see where it settles out. You know, take by the time we model it all out, it probably will be different, very different. Um, so I think we need to just take a breath and uh, before we work this into the modeling, let's see where those those costs settle out. Um, dynamic real estate market in upstate, well, um, inflation will uh, affect the number of projects that can be financed with a set amount of energy dollars um, or of uh, public dollars to to address the energy equation um, but you'll also see if energy costs are rising that um, the decarbonization solutions will look better um, it from that viewpoint so like patrick mentioned before it's kind of a kind of a mixed bag here right thanks craig uh, Kara, I think this next one might be uh, a good one for you to come in with uh, some of your national perspectives. It reads, uh, has window restoration been analyzed in terms of embodied carbon and operating carbon and payback? Upgrading performance with a restoration treatment could have a good concern in payback. Kara, what's your perspective on, on that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, as uh, we did look at operating carbon and costs and payback, and we'll show you more of those details tomorrow, um, as you can anticipate, it's a little bit of a, um, it's not kind of a blanket cost effectiveness story today, um, but I think it really is emerging as an, it's, it's an important strategy for not only um, comfort, but grid resilience and um, operating cost effectiveness. Um, and we have not yet done analysis as part of this work on the embodied carbon impacts, um, but that is definitely underway kind of in other pockets of, of national research that's ongoing. Great, thanks, Kara. Uh, next one here, Greg, I might ask you to, to take point on responding to it. It says, you mentioned workforce uh, development and education, uh, training related to carbon neutral buildings. Does that education and training include outreach to schools of architecture, engineering, and urban planning, providing undergraduate and graduate degrees in New York State? Um, does it or will it? Uh, it certainly will. It, it probably does, but not enough today. We want to certainly expand the uh, curricula uh, uh, for higher education, both in um, you know, four year colleges, but also uh, you know, technical training. Uh, we are developing, expanding our um, workforce development uh, processes and uh, Adele will be, uh, Adele Ferranti will be speaking to you tomorrow about that. Uh, but I would take the question further, right? you know, I'll go back to that slide I was pointing at the beginning. We don't have to wait for uh, graduate degrees to provide this training, you know, there, there's both the training, the technical training to go out and work in the field to get people interested in making a career out of uh, solving the climate issues. But there are also there's also just the education of uh, the general population, and that can start uh, certainly well before uh, higher education in middle and high school to just get people to understand the issues and the impacts of emissions. So yes, yes, and yes, and um, you know, we got to uh, we got to get there though. We're working on it. 
Thanks, Craig. I think this next one uh, might go to you as well, Greg. It reads, uh, what will be done to help address the campus system of NYCHA to meet zero carbon buildings goals? NYCHA's building stock is huge. Financing is challenging, along with po current policies. I believe NYCHA's stock is bigger than, say, the city of Atlanta. So it's like it's a large percent of New York State's building stock. Wondering if you could uh, respond to some of the challenges that NYCHA faces, Greg. Sure, and they are uh, they are many. Um, NYCHA has, uh, I believe, 182,000 apartment units. So I don't know where that uh, stacks up versus Atlanta, but it's a, a huge piece of the the building stock here in New York State. Uh, NYCHA has uh, over the I think about two years ago brought in a, a new uh, CEO. Um, Greg Russ, and he's really focused on uh, holistic building solutions, which I think is is really encouraging. I also see that the federal government, uh, this administration, you know, I have a, a lot of hope that they will pass um, legislation or, or regulations that help fund public housing. Uh, so NYCHA does have uh, a lot of buildings in disrepair, but uh, under the chairman Russ, he is um, focused on trying to develop holistic solutions instead of piecemealing. Like they, you, the, you know, before NYCHA would try to uh, fix roofs on a hundred different buildings and you know leave the rest of the building as it was, right? And now their focus is on trying to go building by building, campus by campus, and get them. Um, renovated and retrofitted and decarbonized. Um, so that's exciting. Uh, we have a, a bit of a, uh, a logistical challenge. Well, it is a logistical challenge at NYSERDA. We actually can't fund subsidies to NYCHA because they uh, get their power from the New York Power Authority and don't pay into what's called the system benefit charge that uh, funds our clean energy fund and creates the pool of funding that uh, NYSERDA uses to incentivize uh, projects. So we have been able to work around that with a couple other of, of sources of funding. It's not, uh, not big dollars, but we're definitely working on providing technical solutions. And if you uh, hearken back to uh, Mikal's note on retrofit New York and the uh, bringing the energy sprung model to the to the US, probably the first real pilot of panelized solutions um, will be on a NYCHA building. They're undertaking it with their own capital uh, to see if it works and, and then hopefully roll that out broadly. We're also working with them to uh, develop a, a broader electrification campaign. So. We're definitely focused on them. A lot of challenges, but uh, a lot of encouraging news coming out of their uh, their change in leadership and their their staff. They're they're really focused on addressing these issues. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate that, uh, Patrick. I think this next one might be a good one for you to uh, to lead our response. It reads, uh, "How can energy service?" Energy as a service be enabled for LMI communities where initial cost for energy efficiency upgrades is a very high barrier. Well, we're, we are funding some uh, innovative market strategies to go after that. I think the, you know, I would say that with regards to decarbonization, some of the uh, district geothermal loops where you would be providing heating as a service are probably the most relevant example. Um, studies are being funded right now by our clean heating and cooling team. And mm -hmm. uh, we will have more funding available for demonstrations in the future. Thanks, Patrick. Um, let's see this next one. Kara, I might ask you to, to come back uh, online to help respond to this next one. It says, given conversion from gas to a heat pump is not currently, in air quotes, cost effective for most consumers, 
and your predictions of cost declines, when do you see the intersection such that heat pumps can make economic sense to the different consumers in existing homes? Carrie, are you able to give us a, a preview or a sneak peek into some of tomorrow's presentation? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. I know cost is top of mind for a lot of this, and so we'll talk a little bit more about business case tomorrow, but um, I, I think I would say that it's pretty hard to blanket um, blanket statement when it's going to happen for all scenarios, because so much depends on the current conditions of the existing buildings. Um, I would venture a guess that it's going to be in the near future between the cost reductions that we talked about today, um, incentives and rebates and the rising cost of energy, integrative design. Um, I think, well, and the fact is you'll see tomorrow that some scenarios are um, approaching cost parity today. Um, so I would say in the very near future, you know, south of 2025. Thanks, Kara. Everybody write it down now. You heard uh, heard from Kara where where the future is going there. Uh, next question, I might take this and ask maybe Greg also to, to chime in with a response. It says the EPA has a draft zero carbon definition that allows for on-site fossil fuels. EPA zero carbon building definition isn't apparent to the panel, but it would be great to align these, i.e. if the EPA would follow my service lead and focus on site energy and no on-site fuel consumption. Um, I'm less familiar with a EPA zero carbon building definition that's been published to date. I know they are considering and working on one. Um, there is very definitely a net zero energy definition that is published and is online, which very accurately does allow for a, uh, a path where buildings can indeed burn on-site fossil fuel and then overproduce renewable energy. Um, I think where New York's policy is going is we're on a legislatively mandated uh, path to having a carbon free grid. So for us, electrification is a, is a major part of the solution. I think there is um, lots of work to be done, but there, there's likely a very successful future for renewable fuels as part of the solution going forward as well. Um, we'll have to see how all of that plays out based on economics and ability to meet buildings demands and needs and things like that. But um, aligning with national experts, EPA and other states is part of our kind of behind the scenes discussion. And we will plan to continue having those discussions um, to, to try to make a, a consistent national policy. Greg, um, can I ask you to, to chime in and, and add anything to that? You can ask me, but you just answered it. Yeah, I, I don't understand how uh, a zero carbon definition could allow burning fossil fuels on site unless they're uh, you know considering uh, offsetting and sequestering carbon in some other place to uh, you know to offset it, it doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense to me so we should probably uh, touch base with our friends at EPA and make sure uh, we're not missing something but I, I agree I think that's about net zero energy versus net zero carbon Okay, sounds like a good follow up task for us to, to start working on. Um, next question, I might start off the answer on this one well, as well. Uh, it comes from one of our, uh, our partners in New York City from the Building Energy Exchange. Amazing work on a, improving performance of individual buildings in concert with this. Are there folks at state level promoting smart growth communities and walkable neighborhoods with modest density? Land use patterns dramatically and simultaneously impact both building performance as well as our transportation footprint, so would complement this work. At the same time, continuing to promote suburban land use patterns will ensure these climate action targets are not met. Um, so I'll, I'll take a first crack at this. You know, NYSERDA does have a number of programs that invest in urban cores and downtowns. It comes across all building types. Um, it's frequently in retrofit, so utility programs and investments also play a significant role there. But we do have a, a significant investment that we make through some of our new construction programs, our carbon neutral community and economic development program, as well as our partnership with uh, our friends down at the uh, New York State Department of State, who run a very successful program called the Downtown Revitalization Initiative. So when you look across the state, partnership between organizations like NYSERDA, utilities, and the New York State Department of State, investing in our downtowns 
you know, it, uh, carbon neutrality as we retrofit buildings, that, that'll bring down the operational carbon. Um, as Greg and Patrick have pointed out in, in meeting after meeting with me that, you know, the, the best way that you can reduce embodied carbon, which is the environmental footprint associated with the, the production and um, construction of materials in buildings, is to continue to reuse existing buildings. So by partnering with uh, the New York State Department of State to reinvest in our urban cores and downtowns, you really do get that co-investment of co uh, carbon neutral operational carbon, really good investment in communities that will help keep vibrant downtowns and uh, urban cores uh, walkable and environmentally and uh, friendly and sustainable. Greg is, or Patrick, is there anything you wanna add to, to my response on that? Well, I, I would just uh, emphasize that that um, that CERTA is really just beginning to try to develop community scale decarbonization projects. So, so going for carbon neutral communities as as opposed to carbon neutral buildings. You know, I mentioned the scale of the task in front of us, the magnitude, the number of buildings. We're not going to reach that goal in thirty years if we go building by building. We've got to be going community by community. And when you think about communities, it's obviously not just buildings, but you do have to figure uh, transportation, the mobility, uh, clean mobility. You got to figure out how it all integrates with uh, the grid in various communities. Um, so we're, we're focused on that and, and thinking about how we integrate the different uh, groups at NYSERDA who, who have different pieces of the solution. Uh, and, and bring it all together. So that's a uh, it's probably a good topic for our next iteration of the roadmap is how far we're getting on that and and where how we can drive that further. Thanks, Greg. I know we're getting down to the the last few minutes. Questions keep rolling in, so I, I, it doesn't look like we'll be able to get through all of them. Uh, maybe we try to do a couple of uh, speed round responses here uh, to keep things uh, to get responses out to as many questions as possible. Uh, so this one clearly, Greg, is going to go to you. Um, I appreciate Greg highlighting the Grimm School and his comment that we can't start too young or too early when it comes to educating youth about climate change. I wholeheartedly agree. Given those young people spend the majority of their hours in school buildings when we aren't in a pandemic, what is the opportunity to add P through 12 school buildings as a strategic building type in the carbon neutral buildings roadmap in the not too distant future? Yeah, so those uh, K through 12 is uh, among the um, building typologies that are at the top of our list to uh, expand into in the next uh, the next iteration of the roadmap. But we're not going to wait. We're not going to wait for the roadmap. There, um, we think there's a lot of opportunity in that building sector, and and I sort of is developing programs and trying to figure out how to. Um, expand those programs to reach as many schools as possible. Um, so we're focused on it today and uh, good point. Thanks, Greg. Patrick, I think this next one uh, might be best suited to go over to you for a response. Uh, it reads, are policies in place to stop new buildings from being built that will then immediately need retrofit upgrades? Are there lists of incentive programs aligned with these plans? Well, I'm assuming when you say immediately need upgrades, you're talking about at end of life, uh, the equipment that's put in the building won't be able to be replaced with similar equipment. So um, NYSERDA has a number of new construction programs that provide assistance all, um, currently to decarbonize your building. The programs are based on aspects of what we expect to be in the next two code cycles. Uh, we also have a very successful buildings of excellence competition in the multifamily sector, which represents 40% of our uh, of New York State's new construction. In, and then the, in the uh, currently available in the market, we also have funding uh, for de decarbonization of new and existing buildings under uh, carbon neutral for economic development for new buildings, which would include planning as well as funding demonstrations 
And then under the carbon challenge, we have money for electrifying existing buildings. So we do have programs to support it. Um, I mean, it is a difficult challenge to communicate what you expect the energy code to be uh, one and two code cycles from now. Also, uh, we expect that for existing buildings, they will mostly be driven not by building code, but by um, because the code that applies to them, unless there's major changes, is the code under which they were built. So they're more affected by product standards and by uh, our plan to do emission standards. So communicating to building owners and developers, architects and designers, what the requirements are going to be in the future is a major part of this initiative. In fact, the carbon neutral buildings roadmap itself is part of it. Yeah, and you'll see that uh, when we talk tomorrow about what the policies are not in place today, but they're coming. Uh, they're at least they're going to be strongly recommended by our roadmap and by the uh, um, energy efficiency and housing panel. They've already been recommended, and the key is that transparency that come five years, seven years, ten years, depending on your building typology. Here's what you will have to do then. And in New York City, you've got local law 97 today driving people to make decisions. So when I go out there and you'll also see tomorrow that the cost in the incremental cost in new construction is marginal. Um, so there's just no reason to be building something today that you're going to have to uh, rip out the heating system tomorrow. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Patrick. Um, we've had a, a great session of QA and, and questions keep rolling in and unfortunately we just won't have the ability to respond to every question uh, right now today. We do encourage everybody to continue submitting your questions and of course to go to our website and submit questions formally. Um, John, if I could ask you to advance the slides to the next slide, please. So thank you. Uh, this is, again, just the first half of content for the draft of the roadmap. Tomorrow we'll be uh, uh, going out with another webinar and we'll pre be presenting the second half. We hope and encourage that you will join us for that webinar as well. As a reminder, topics covered during tomorrow's session will include the value proposition and solution sets of carbon neutral uh, policy recommendations, approach to disadvantaged communities, workforce needs, and a review of case studies that are already demonstrating carbon neutral buildings in the real world. These are projects that are going on out in the world. Next slide, please. Um, I know this was a lot to absorb. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your very active participation today and for your attention. We've got a huge number of people who, who really hung in there for two full hours of, of a lot of material. The presentations from today and tomorrow are available on our website as of now and we will post the recordings later this week with full transcript. We're interested in what you have to say and look forward to reviewing the additional comments as we move forward. Wishing everybody a, a great rest of your day and hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks very much.